So, let's see. Today is September 8th. I think my ink finally has given up the ghost. Get some more of those. We'll swap out cartridges. All right, so there we go. September 8th. 2020 and we're going to talk about frictional forces and I'm going to zoom this up frictional forces and the thing you need to know about friction to start with is that out of all the forces we have, friction is the one that has two forms of it. One form is called static friction, and one is called kinetic friction. And static friction would be when the objects are stationary. Okay? There's two types. There is static which is the force you must overcome to start an object into motion. And then there is kinetic which is the frictional force on a moving object. So, static friction, static friction, static friction. That's the one we do the most often in here, actually. And kinetic friction is going to work very similarly. But, we talked about forces, and we draw these free body diagrams, and we're starting to put math on them. When we do this, what's the only force that actually has a formula thus far? That you say, force of this is, and there's an equation that goes with it. The, the force of gravity is the only one that actually has an equation and it's mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity which we usually use 10 for although the one accepted by the scientific community as the average gravitational acceleration on earth is 9.81 here in Tennessee it's a little bit less than that in Murfreesboro because we're a little bit up from sea level not enough to worry about obviously if you go to the top of Mount Everest Everest is about five miles up. So yes, gravity is noticeably different there, but not so noticeably different that you can float to the top. That would be awesome. More people would probably do it. Um, and the Marianas Trench, you probably know the Marianas Trench is the deepest spot in the ocean, somewhere around 11 kilometers. It's deeper down than Everest is tall. And so... Uh, in the Marianas Trench, the acceleration due to gravity is actually a lot larger because you're now closer to the center of the Earth. So gravity is going to depend where you're located on the Earth's surface. But that's the only force that we have that has a formula. All the other forces we figure out based on what's happening in the problem. So force applied, we have to figure out because it's in the problem. The general statement for force is mass times acceleration. But for these, static friction, there is a maximum value of static friction. These have to be determined move over a little bit.
So these are generally determined by other forces in the problem. But there is a formula for the maximum amount of static friction. <coughs> and it works like this. Force of friction maximum is mu times force normal. Mu or mu s or mu k are the symbols for the coefficient of friction. And those are Greek letters. Greek letters. The Greek letter mu, just like mu alpha theta, which in Greek is math. That's how you would write math in Greek. That's why the Honor Society for Math is mu alpha theta. M-A-T-H. And here, mu is going to be the coefficient of friction, at least until we get to electricity and magnetism, and it'll go with something else. It'll be a different coefficient. But this number is sort of a stickiness factor, if you like. The stickiness factor. At least that's how I think of it. And it tells me how rough or smooth the surface is. Generally, mu is between zero and one. But some substances have mu greater than one. Let me give you some examples of those. NASCAR tires. Mu is somewhere around two, maybe as high as two and a half. Why would a NASCAR tire have a very low, large coefficient of friction. Yeah? Right. Which is also why they boil their tires off because of the friction. I don't know if you realize that. Uh, cars that race, they don't change their tires because the tread gets worn out. They're literally boiling the rubber off the tires. The tires are melting. But you do. You want a sticky tire if you're driving very fast around curves. The typical tire road friction that you have in your everyday life is somewhere around 0 0.6. About 0 0.6. But NASCAR tires tend to be two or a little bit higher. I haven't checked that recently, but they want them to be very full of friction, if you will. What's another thing that might have a high coefficient of friction? Brake pads and, yes, brake pads on cars, which is also why you have to replace those eventually because you're basically, it's like if you've ever ridden a bike and used your feet to stop, your shoes get worn out. Your shoes get worn out. Same basic idea here. Um, sandpaper has a very high coefficient of friction because the goal is to pull off the excess wood, right? Or the excess whatever material you happen to be sanding down. But most of the stuff we deal with is more in this range. So, for example, ice is typically around 0 0.10. Floors in a school building, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, somewhere in that neighborhood. But you have to realize that 
this number changes depending on the two materials you have. So, you guys are using paper and pencils, some of you. Some of you are using pens and paper. But if you were to look at paper up close and personal, zoom in on paper, what you're going to see is very jagged edges. Because basically what they do to make paper is they shave down trees and then they take them and they take the little strips of paper, strips of wood in our case, or strips of papyrus if you were Egyptian, and they would just mash them on top of each other and you treat them with chemicals so they'll be white. So it looks like a whole bunch of little planks laying at weird angles all on top of each other and you mush it down really, really, really tight, kind of like plywood. Those of you that know about plywood, you've seen it. But when you zoom in with a microscope and look at paper, it looks very jagged because the surface is very rough when you're close to it. You need it to be rough, though, because as you write with your paper and pen, if you're writing with a pencil, you have a pencil tip, right? <coughs> Clearly not drawn to scale. So as this pencil comes in here, it starts to deposit its material because the material is being scraped off as you drag it across the pencil, or the pencil across the paper, and you read that as writing. When in fact, what you've actually done is just scrape graphite off the end of your pencil and fill in all the little valleys. Those aren't completely smooth either, but they're more smooth than they were a minute ago. Okay? So how does a ballpoint pen work? Same idea, except that you drag your pencil, your pen across, right? And the little roller ball rolls and ink comes out on the side. And the ink bleeds into the paper. So it doesn't deposit like the graphite does, but it does bleed into. Some of the color stays there. So rough surfaces, this, this coefficient measures the roughness of a surface. And it's different for different materials. So if I take these shoes on these floor, there's a number for coefficient of friction. If I take these shoes on that pavement out there, it's a different number. If I take your shoes on this floor, it's probably a different, slightly different number than my shoes on this floor. So the coefficient of friction is something that either you have to calculate based on what they give you in the problem, or they tell you what it is. Most of the times on the AP test, they tell you what it is. Okay? So how do we find this thing? Well, let's come back up here. This piece is the formula that we will use for the maximum amount of force. So if I want to take this chair down off the top of this desk and I go to push it, I can apply a little bit of force and it won't move anywhere. Right? Push a little bit and it doesn't move anywhere. If I push hard enough, it starts to slide. So when we talk about the maximum friction force, I'm talking about how hard do I have to push to make it start moving. Well, pushing the chair is one thing, but if I want to move the chair and desk simultaneously, bigger force or smaller force? Why bigger? One, there's more mass to move. And force is proportional to mass, so yeah. And then second of all, it's probably more friction between chair, feet, and floor than it is smooth seat of desk and theoretically smooth desktop. Does that make sense? So I could go along here and push, and you'll notice that it sticks. In fact, it starts to rotate. So that tells me those feet down there had more frictional force than the feet on the back. But I can push it and make it go, right? This frictional force will be, the maximum frictional force is a static friction force, and it's the maximum amount that you can have before the object starts moving. So if I push, if the maximum amount of force is 100 newtons, and I push with 60 newtons, I get nothing. If I push with 75 newtons, I get nothing. 
it matches me until what happens? Until I get over that 100. When I get over the 100, then I start to... Okay? All right. So, let's talk about a few of these now. Why do you think it depends on the normal force? Why would why would normal force be in this problem? Yeah, think. Normal force goes with what? Typically it balances gravity, right? Typically. But uh, what happens if I take things and I push down harder on the top? Because remember, all our surfaces in real life, even the ones that feel fairly smooth to us, are kind of rough on the edges. So if I take a slightly rough on the edges one here and a slightly rough on the edges one here and I try to slide them across, what happens? They get, they get stuck, right? They get hung up as I try to slide two rough surfaces next to each other. If I go then and push down on the top surface, now what have I got? There's going to be more resistance because there's more surface-to-surface -surface contact. Which means that some of these may have to break off for the other ones to get past. So if I increase the normal force, in other words, let's say that Lauren, and you wouldn't do this, but if you were to sit right here, I'm going to move this chair, and you, you go, no, you're not, and you come plop right here on this chair. What has she done to the normal force? She, she has a mass of her own, right, and a weight down. And so that weight is going to push down, so there will be a corresponding normal force that will have to push up. I've now made the, the normal force go up, so now it's harder to move the chair. Not just because she has mass, but because she's also sort of mashed down on these two so that their surfaces are closer together, and therefore you get more friction out which is why NASCAR cars are also fairly heavy. They're not really, you don't make them heavy to race in them, but the fact that they are heavy helps give a little bit more traction. Also, what about the tires? Do they keep them perfectly inflated or do they let them a little low or a little high? Because? Yeah, if the tire's a little bit flatter, not like flat, flat, but a little bit flatter, then the tire spreads out a little bit more, you get more of a footprint on the ground. NASCAR tires, though, do not have those cute little channels that we have. They don't have little treads like we've got. Why not? We want all the surface area we can possibly get in contact with the, the ground. We don't want that because if it rains, we want the water to go out from under the tire. You may know water doesn't compress very well. If you've ever belly flopped, you understand that water does not compress very well. And if you try to drive on it and it doesn't compress and you have a flat tire or a bald tire is usually the word that's used for it, you hydroplane. It takes a quarter of an inch of water to hydroplane. A quarter of an inch. So just so you guys know, that's your pinky finger final joint. If this is longer than the treads on your tires, don't drive through puddles. You're asking for it. You're just asking for it. But I digress. Fluids are a topic in AP Physics too. So how do we usually figure out frictional forces? Well, we do something like this. And I'm going to flip over here so that I can put up some pictures that are kind of like the ones you have in your little packet that I gave you. I get over there. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay.
Okay. When you're on the team, there's the right answer. What do you mean? Like, I'm making a quiz. On a form? Yeah. Then you just click beside it. It did let me click. Okay. I'll be there in a second. They're helping me. This time. Okay. All right. So, let's look at this problem we've got on the board. And I'm going to draw it over here while you look at it and see if you can figure out where all the numbers should be. Force gravity. Force tension. Five degrees. Force normal. Force friction. Okay. It says this box is being pulled at constant speed across a frictional surface. Constant speed across a frictional surface. Perform an extensive force analysis of the diagram. Fill in all the blanks. Okay? So we've got to find all these values. All right? They tell us this one is 80 newtons. So our force applied is 80 newtons. Now, see which other ones you can figure out is probably gravity. So you know that force due to gravity is mass times 10, mass times gravity. So we get force due to gravity would be 20 times 10. So this one is 200, and the unit for it is the Newton. Okay? Now, I'm going to flip over here. Now uh, you've seen the problem. I'm going to flip it back over to the other side where I can finish drawing on it. So here's what I need to do. <clears throat> I need to do a free body diagram to help me. So the free body diagram is going to have force due to gravity down, force normal up, and force, force applied up and right, and force friction back. So is the normal force in this problem equal to gravity? Is the normal force equal to gravity in this problem? Okay, so the answer is no. Why is it not equal to gravity in this problem? Because the applied force pulls how? Up and right. So the applied force has an up and a right. So we're going to have to use some trig to figure that out, okay? And I'm going to flip over to the next page so I have some space to work. So here's my force applied, 80 newtons. And they tell us this is a 45-degree angle. So if I want to find the X component of the applied force and the... Y component of the applied force, I'm going to use Fx over 80 equals cosine 45, and Fy over 80 equals sine of 45. The sine of 45 and the cosine of 45 are the same. 0.7071. So then x is just 80 times that, which is 56. So 56.5, 6.56 would be 56.6. Okay. And likewise, this one is also 0 0.7071 because it's a 45, 45, 90 triangle. So force Y is also 56.6 newtons. 
Okay. So now, here's what I can fill in in my picture. You do not ever put this on a free body diagram, by the way. You don't put the forces on there. You don't put anything except the forces on there. But, because we're solving the problem and we want to have a working picture for us, we want to have a working picture, I now know that this bit is 56.6 uh, and this bit is 56.6. And now, let's write our sum of forces statements. What horizontal forces do we have? Well, let's see. They told us we were going at constant speed. So constant speed means I'm not accelerating. If I'm not accelerating, mass times acceleration would be zero because I'm not accelerating. No acceleration. So what forces do I have? What horizontal forces do I have? I have force of friction to the left and part of the force applied to the right and they have to add up to zero. I also know what the force applied is. 56.6 equals zero. So force of friction must equal 56.6. Probably 99 times out of 100, that's going to be how you find your frictional force. You will find it from the sum of the forces statement, not find it directly, because typically you're working with a force that you know and some ones you don't. And friction doesn't have a formula unless you want to know what's the most force I have to use. Now I'll stop there because there was a lot of math that just happened and there may be some questions about the lot of math that just happened. Anything? Yeah? So when you got your answer, you mm -hmm. just like no, I added plus, I did this. I did algebra. Or if you like, you can subtract the 56.6 from, then you get negative equals negative and divide out a negative one. No, I do not ignore signs, their directions. But a lot of times I do, I skip algebra steps. So if I, if I skip an algebra step and you don't see it, yes, please ask. So what I did here was we had negative force of friction, 56.6 equals zero. When the, the two legs being equal? Yeah, that's the only time it comes out like that. Okay. What forces do we have in the vertical direction? I have applied from the Y. We have normal that points up and we have gravity that points down. So I'm going to move all of this through the joy of arrows over here. So, force Y applied, force normal minus force gravity equals zero. This is 56.6. I don't know. This is 200. I'm going to add this to get it moved over. So force normal equals 
200 minus 56.6. So force normal is 143.4 newtons. And as we suspected, the normal force is in fact not as big as gravity because you have a, another force that is helping you. Once again, I will pause there for questions. Actually, I'm going to stop here. <laughs>